Are you excited about studying God's Word this morning? Yes, sir. Yeah. See, good as new. Good as new. All right, take your Bible with me and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, as we will conclude our series in the book of 1 Thessalonians today. Uh, today will be the, the last Sunday I'll be up here for another month. Uh, next week will be Pastor Dan sharing the Word. And then I'm excited to tell you that Two weeks from today, my father-in-law will be here sharing the Word of God with you guys. And then Pastor Dan will be uh, carrying the rest of uh, August with you all. So you get a whole month to recover from my preaching. Uh, but as of today, for today, we will be here in First Thessalonians chapter 5. And before we uh, begin, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer and ask for Him to speak to us. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the freedom and the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ for those of us who believe. God, we pray that you would um, illuminate your word before our eyes this morning. God, as the psalmist prays that you would open our eyes to see the wonder, the, the glory that's found in your word. God, that is the glory of Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would soften our heart. Give us minds that understand, ears that listen. God, may we also have feet and hands that are quick to obey. God, may you give us grace this morning to trust you, to follow you, to obey you, God, as we listen from your Holy Spirit and learn what you have to say to us today and how we should live as we continue on looking forward to your return. God, we love you. We give this time to you. May you visit us and may you speak to us this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Emily and I have a little dog named Lucy that we love, love, love to death. And uh, she is a mini schnauzer mix. And so if you know anything about schnauzers, they make for good guard dogs. And so her ears are always listening and she's always on the alert. Uh, at every single little noise, she is there to investigate, to bark at whatever person might be passing by. And, uh, and this morning, as we were letting her out to do her business, um, she saw a cat on the other side of the lawn. And as a good guard dog, she just sat there and watched. And she was so alert, making sure that the cat would not intrude upon her territory and, and, and guarding the house like a good guard dog would. And did you know that that level of alertness, that watchfulness, is also expected of us as believers when it comes to the soon return of Jesus. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. So let's look at a text today in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and see what the Word of God has to say to us about being alert. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1, beginning verse 1, he says, Now as to the times and the epochs, uh, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety... Then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pangs upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober." For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we're of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for the obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. Therefore... Encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you esteem them very highly, that's a big, long Greek word right there, in love because of their, of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brethren, admonish 
admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak. Be patient with everyone. And that right there might be the most difficult command in the whole Bible. Um, See that no one repays one another, or no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. What in the world are we supposed to do with that? Right? Now, before we go on, I'm just going just to address that verse for a little bit. Right? Paul's not talking about the full-on, smoochy, smoochy, you know, mouth-to-mouth, tongue-and-lips combo here. Right? So, if you're going to come up and give me the whole full-on tongue-and-lips thing after I preach, I'm not going to receive that. Right? This, is, this is talking about the, the cultural... What, is, what was appropriate in his culture and historical time. And likely he's talking about the, the, the cheek-to-cheek kind of thing that you see with you know, people in the Middle East and Mediterranean area. Uh, he's not talking about a full-on kiss here. Notice the, the adjective, a holy kiss. So um, I'm just going to leave that there. Uh, verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this Letter read to all the brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Now, I wish I had two weeks to address this whole chapter here, but here's what we got. Uh, But in the first half of this chapter, we see that Paul is continuing on something that he has been talking about in the previous chapter. And what we see here is that Paul is saying there's something they don't need to know. All along in this letter, Paul has been reminding of the Thessalonians what they already knew. That is, in chapter 1, Paul reminded the Thessalonians of the gospel by which they were saved. That is, that Paul reminded the Thessalonians that they turned from idols to a living God in order to wait for the son who comes out from heaven, comes down from heaven, and to save them. Then secondly, in chapter 2, Paul reminded the Thessalonians that, uh, of, of who they are and how they were as ministers to the Thessalonians, that they were upright, that they were diligent, that they showed themselves to be men of integrity. Chapter 3, Paul reminded the Thessalonians that persecution would come for Paul and his companions, and so it came to pass. So after chapter 1, 2, and 3, when Paul reminded the Thessalonians of what they already knew, in chapter 4, Paul then told the Thessalonians what they needed to know. That is, that Paul talked about the second coming of Jesus, that Christ will return and that the dead will rise, the dead in Christ will rise, and that those of us who remain will be caught up in the air to welcome him so that they would not grieve as those who do not have hope, as those who do not know Jesus, right? Because believers are starting to die, whether from persecution or old age, and, and these, these Thessalonians were beginning to grieve as though without hope. And Paul filled in for them what was lacking in the faith. Paul told them what they needed to know. So now after Paul telling them, reminding them what they already knew and what they needed to know, now Paul tells them that there's something they don't need to know. In verse 1, Paul says it's the time and the epoch of what? Of the day of the Lord. What in the world is the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord is a day, something that the Old Testament prophets have been prophesizing about that is now continued on into the New Testament. The day of the Lord is a day of wrath and judgment. It is a day when the Lord will return to set things, to set the score straight, to make things right. It is a day when God will pour out his wrath onto those who are wicked, onto those who have never believed in him or follow him. These are the folks who will suffer the judgment and wrath of God, that they are going to be the one receiving the full anger of God's wrath. 
That is the day of the Lord. It is the day when God will set the, thing, set the scores right, set the record straight, and he will make things right. Paul says that as to the times and the epochs, there are actually two different Greek words here. As to the chronos, the Greek word chronos here is where we get the words like chronology, chronological order. What he's talking about is that down to the minute, the chronology, you don't need to know. And as to the epoch, the kairos, the season, the divinely appointed time when Jesus will return, there is no need for us to know. This is reminiscent of what Jesus said in Matthew 24. That is the time and the day when the Son of Man will return, no one knows except the Father. We do not need to know exactly at what day, at which hour, Jesus will return. And so goes all those people out there uh, in history and even now who predict that Jesus will come back on whatever you know, day and month of whatever year. You can tell them that they're wrong. Because the Bible tells us that no one knows that very day and hour and that we don't need to stand around and sit around speculating as to when exactly Jesus will come. This is something we don't need to know. And Paul goes on to say what we do know in verse 2 is that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And so as he talks about the day of the Lord, we need to know also that Paul links this with the second coming of Jesus. So likely, these two things, the second coming of Jesus and the day of the Lord, are either one and the same or closely related. That either with the return of Jesus comes the day of the Lord, or closely following the, the, the return of Jesus and the rapture, well then, after that, comes the day of the Lord and judgment. But regardless of when it is, how it is, and whatever, however it unfolds, we know that we don't need to know exactly what time that is, and Paul uses two metaphors to describe the day of the Lord. First, he says that it will come like a thief in the night, and then in verse 3, he compares it to labor pangs upon a woman with child. Both of these things, the arrival of the thief and the arrival of a child, childbirth, labor pain, they come unannounced. They come unexpectedly. In as much as these two things come unexpectedly, surprise, the Lord will return in a surprising manner to the world. Look at what Paul goes on to say in verse 3. He says, while they are saying peace and safety, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Notice also not only does Paul use two different metaphors to describe the day of the Lord, he also makes two contrasts. First of all, you notice in verses 1 and 2 that he addresses the Thessalonians as you. You have no need for anyone to write anything to you, and you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Then he switches in verse 3 to say, but while they are saying peace and safety, who in the world are they? They are the folks who have never made this decision to trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior, to follow Him and commit their lives to Him. These are the unbelievers. This is the rest of the world that Paul is talking about. That's the they that Paul is talking about. So that's the first contrast here. Second, we see, again, he returns to you, verse 4, but you, brethren... Again, he's talking about believers here. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that you are sons of light and sons of day. And then he says, for those who sleep, sleep at night. But since we are uh, sons of day and sons of light, let us not sleep as though the rest, the rest of the world. So there is the, the you and the sons of day and the sons of light. And then there is the, the rest of them who sleep and who get drunk at night. So there are these two contrasts going on. Paul is reminding us of who we are in Christ, that we're a children of light and children of day, that we are the ones who belong to the light, and that we have no need to be asleep. We should not be asleep. What is this imagery of sleeping here? Well, it's not that we should like 
you know, tape our eyelids open and stay awake 24-7, 365, right? That's not what Paul is talking about. What Paul is saying is that just like when we're asleep, we're unaware of what is going on in the world. Paul is telling us that we should keep our eyes open, not that we should not sleep, but that we should be aware of what is going on in the world. We should be aware of the different things that the Bible talks about when, when the world will come to an end. Jesus tells us that in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be pestilence, plagues, i.e. COVID-19, right? And, and, and there will be uproars and distress in our world. These are signs of the end times. Furthermore, Jesus tells us, and the Bible says, that in the last days there will be a great falling away of the saints. Right? The falling away does not belong to the world. The world has already fallen away. They already don't believe Jesus. But it's the saints who fall away from Christ, who do not want to be a part of the church anymore, who do not want to come and worship Jesus anymore. They've gotten complacent. They've gotten lazy and say, you know what, I can just switch on the TV or computer and watch Alex preach. I don't know why they want to do that, but, you know, you know I could watch, you know, whoever, whichever preacher I want to choose, I can switch it on and boom, there it is, right? And they stop fellowshipping with other believers, right? These are signs of the end that we are to be aware of, alert and sober. The word, he gives us two commands. Not only does he, does he use two metaphors, he tells us two commands that we're to obey. The word here is to be alert is the Greek word gregoreo. Gregoreo, from where we get the name Gregory. So the next time you meet a person named Gregory, you go up to him and point him and say, be alert. <laughs> and hopefully you don't get punched, right? But uh, interestingly, <laughs> There, there's a guy named Greg that I have come to know who is a security guard, and he was very alert. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's the word, right? We're going to be, be alert, Gregoreo. This word, Gregoreo, is used by Jesus in Matthew 24 when he says, Be assured that if the master of the house knew at which hour the thief would come, he would be alert and watch he also uses the same word, Gregoreo, when he talked about slaves, slaves, stewards of the house, who would be alert and on the watch, looking for the return of the master. That is the idea here. Just like our little dog Lucy would be alert at every noise that she hears and every person that passes by, so we should be alert, keeping our eyes and ears open to every sign that we see in the world. Every indication that Jesus is coming soon. If I were you, I would keep my eyes open to what's happening in the Middle East. If I were you, I would keep our eyes open, watching for how our world is changing, how increasingly hostile our world is to a biblical value, biblical truth, and who Jesus is. If I were you, I would keep our eyes open to where our fellow brothers and sisters are. Are they still here? And how many chairs, how many empty pews we see in our church? That's, those are signs of the end times. Paul says in the last days, people's hearts would grow cold and they would want their ears tickled. And following deceitful ways, they would fall away and turn away from the truth. Be alert. Be watchful. The second command that Paul gives us is to be sober. Not only does this communicate a sense of alertness and being awake, but this is in contrast to what Paul says about the rest of the world. He says in verse 7 that those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and that those who get drunk get drunk at night. This is not simply a, a command against drunkenness, but this is a, a, a saying about how when people get drunk, this is an idea of given unto senseless self-indulgence. Being sober then is, means to, to be sensitive to what God is doing, being alert rather than given into self-pleasure and indulgence, rather than being dead to the world and not even aware 
of things that are happening around you. Instead of that, we're to be alert and sober. In fact, Paul gives us that command twice. Be sober, verse 6, and he's, he says it again in verse 8. Be sober. Notice how also the rest of the world are totally unaware. Verse 3, he says, they're telling each other peace and safety, then destruction. Really, the, the expression there in Greek is death and destruction will overtake them like a thief in the night, like labor that comes upon a woman suddenly, labor pain that comes upon a woman suddenly. You know, as we look at this verse, you know, I couldn't help but just being reminded of what happened last year. When we were hearing about this little virus that was ravaging China and Asia back in late December, January, there were so many of us, so many people on this other side of the world who are laughing at the virus, who would say, yeah, that will never come over here. That's just going to stay over there. And, and we were totally unaware and caught off guard. But then by March, mid-March, COVID came over the seas. And next thing you know, everybody was panicking. All the stores were emptied of their paper towel, uh, toilet paper for whatever reason, right? And, and everything was shut down. In as much as, and even more so, as COVID caught us off guard, Paul is telling us that Jesus will return even more suddenly than we would ever expect. Whereas we would hear about it, hear about COVID back last year in January, Jesus would just suddenly appear, breaks through the cloud, and we would be caught by surprise if we were unaware. Furthermore, notice how also Paul gives us these commands to be alert and be sober based on who we are. It's because we're sons of light and sons of day that we should keep our eyes open. It's because we belong to Jesus that we should look for Jesus when he comes back. We are servants of the master. All the more, we should look for the return of the masters. We are sons of light and sons of days. The Bible is not just a compilation of a bunch of do's and don'ts. The Bible is a book about how we are in a relationship with God. And as a result of our relationship with Him, we should behave accordingly. And because we who believe in Jesus relate to God as His people and His children, we should look for the return of our Lord. Be alert and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Paul further modifies his command to be sober in verse 8. And there we see again the Pauline triad. If you've been following along, we know what the Pauline triad is. There are the, the, the three famous little words that you would find in 1 Corinthians 14. That after all these gifts, and at the end of the day, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And there you see them again in verse 8. But since we are of the day, let us, again, there's the command, be sober. How? Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, there is that word, the hope of salvation. Inasmuch as breastplates and helmets protect us, so we are to guard ourselves from being surprised by the return of Jesus with a mature faith. The Pauline triad, Paul uses these three things to measure how sound, how healthy is the faith and spiritual life of a church. If a church is steadfast in their faith, full of love for one another and for the world, and full of hope because of the return of Jesus, that is a healthy church, according to Paul. You see it over and over in Paul's letters. You see it in 1 Corinthians. You see it here in the Thessalonians letter. You see it again also in Ephesians. Um, right here, Paul is telling us that we are to be sober. We're to stay alert and stay aware of Jesus' return by making sure that we grow in our faith, that our faith is steadfast. No matter what happens in the world, no matter what persecution might take place, our faith is steady, steadfast, rock solid, that we are to put on the breastplate of love, loving one another and loving people who are outside of the church. Furthermore, we're to put on, notice how he singles out the hope of salvation, because again, the Thessalonians lacked hope. 
And so he emphasized that by making sure we put on the helmet of salvation in as much as a helmet gets on your head, we are to remind ourselves that Jesus is coming soon. I hope you haven't missed the fact that the return of Jesus is a big deal. A lot of us live life as though there is no day of accountability. As though Jesus is never coming back, not in our lifetime, we don't have to worry about it, and we can live however we want. But the fact of the matter is, as you examine the Bible and examine the New Testament, the thought and the reminder of Jesus coming back to hold us accountable is all throughout the pages of the New Testament. We have forgotten how important of the matter it is that Jesus is coming back soon. Not only should eschatology, the return of Jesus and the things of last day, matter to us in our everyday life, the fact that Jesus saved us should also govern how we live. He reminds us that we should grow up in our faith in verse 8. And then he says in verses 9 and 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, right? Wrath belongs to those who have rejected Jesus. God's judgment goes out to those who rejected Jesus. But for us, God has destined believers for the obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that salvation is only found, obtained, possessed, have, or to be had, uh, through Jesus Christ. That means apart from Jesus, if you've never believed Jesus, if you've never received Jesus, you have no salvation, you have no hope, and you have no way of being saved. Salvation is through Jesus who died for us. The word for carries the idea of being substitute atonement. That he died in our place for our sin. He took the punishment that we were supposed to bear. Christ died in our place to satisfy God's, God's wrath. And because he died for us and rose again, we could be saved, that we may be saved, and that now we are saved when we're believe it, believers in him. So that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. On the basis of what Jesus has done for us, Paul reminds us that we can live together with him and that we can have hope. Paul goes on to say in verse 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing the word build up. Well, first of all, there are two words here that he uses. Encourage one another is parakaleo. Para, it means to come alongside. Parakaleo, you see a picture of a coach on the sideline encouraging his players to try harder, to play harder, to keep going. That's the idea of encouraging one another. They were to come alongside a fellow believer who is down and say, hey, you got this. Let's keep going. Let's keep following Jesus. Don't quit. Don't give up. And then he uses the word build up, which is a construction word to build up one another. Jesus uses this word to say, no one who is a wise builder would build his house on the sand. This is the picture of someone building a house. In as much as when you build a house, first you dig a hole in the ground, then you lay the foundation and then the plumbing, and then you begin to put down the beams and the sidewalls and then the roof, and then you begin to fill it in with windows and doors and carpet and all those things, right? You know, that's the picture of a Christian's life, right? We begin with the foundation that is Jesus, that he died for our sin, he paid for our debt, we believe in him, and we commit to live our lives for him. That's the foundation of our faith, or otherwise, house. And then we build on that. We progress and we mature. But for many of you, you have nothing more than a mere bare foundation in your faith. That you're satisfied with nothing except just, well, I'm saved, I believe Jesus, and I'm good. But the Bible tells us that we're to mature in our faith, that we're to build up one another, that we're going to have more than just a foundation. We must add on to our faith, following Jesus and, and good works for Him. Not that good works saved us, but because He saved us, so we serve Him and work for Him. 
right? We are to build up on that foundation of Jesus having saved us, and now we live for Him. And the best way we do that is to make sure we stay in the Word, stay in prayer, stay in fellowship to encourage one another. Notice how Paul says in verse 11, encourage one another. You can't do that if you're by yourself. You can't do that if you're not connected to one another, talking to one another, right? You've you got to be in fellowship with one another. You've got to be in life group, Sunday school, be in touch with each other. Get each other's numbers and say, hey, what are you reading? in the Word today. You know, here's what I got. Share with one another what the Lord is saying to you from His Word. So, Paul is reminding us, in as much as Jesus is coming soon, and we don't know when He is coming, we must first make sure that we're mature in the faith, be alert, and be sober, so that we can be watching for Jesus to come back. And then as he ends this chapter, he gives us a series of fairly straightforward commands that you can, you can read and understand on your own, but there are a few things that, that I'll call your attention to. Verses 12 and 13, he talks about how we should be relating to our pastors and our teachers. He says, but we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate, in the NAS, NASB, respect, uh, in the ESV, acknowledge, in the NIV, what in the world is this word? That you appreciate those who diligently labor over you. The word here is the Greek word hoida, which at its basic meaning means to know. But this word to know, hoida, means way more than just like, oh yeah, I know about this thing. That is more than just head knowledge. In fact, on the night when Jesus was betrayed and Peter was caught following Jesus, and three times Peter was, was questioning whether Peter knew Jesus, Peter uses this word hoida to say, I don't know. I do not hoida this man, right? What he's saying is, I have no association with, I don't have any relationship with, I don't know this person intimately, personally. That's the word hoida, right? And that same idea is used in elsewhere of the Bible. Paul prays in Ephesians that we would hoida, that we would know intimately and personally the hope that is found in Jesus. And so what Paul is telling us here that you hoida, that you appreciate those who labor over you, is that you get to know and be at a personal friendship knowledge level of those who labor over you, your pastors, your teachers. Few people in any congregation understand the time and the labor that a pastor puts into a sermon that is worth listening. The hours that it takes to wrestle through the text, to make it relevant, to make it applicable to our audience today. Not to mention the hours and time that a pastor takes to pray over his congregation that the people of God might be mature in the faith, that they might take their faith seriously and walk with Jesus. Furthermore, few people would know the heartache and the pain that a pastor and teacher in a congregation would go through, seeing the immaturity of God's people seeing how their lives are out of line, that they're caught up in sin, seeing that there are unbelievers in a church refusing to trust Jesus. And so Paul says that we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate, deeply appreciate, and get to know the pastors and teachers who labor over you. Take them out to lunch and dinner. Give them a phone call to encourage them. Write them a card and say thank you for all you do. Love on them. Spoil them. He says that you appreciate those who diligently labor over you. What in the world is that? You know, it's the Greek word kopiao, from where we get the word copious. If you are taking copious notes, that means that by the end of a lecture, you have a stack of paper, a stack of notes in front of you. It's the word of abundance, that these folks are diligently, abundantly laboring over you, and they have charge over you in the Lord, pastor and teachers are like shepherds. They are accountable for your spiritual growth before the Lord. These are folks who have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. What are we to do with them? We're to appreciate them. We're to deeply appreciate them, thank them, respect them, get to know them, 
and that you <laughs> and that you esteem them very highly. Uh, this is a huge long Greek word that means abundantly more. You love them so much that you love their socks off. It's what Paul is saying. That you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. And then he gives us some very straightforward instructions to be at peace with one another, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. And then actually the, the real shortest verse in the Bible is verse 16, rejoice always. Right? People think you know, Jesus wept in the Gospel of John is the shortest verse. Well, in the Greek, it's actually a little bit longer. Rejoice always is much happier, right? You know, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. This is not talking about, you know, staying up all night, you know, 24 7, we're always going to be praying. In the Middle Ages, some monks tried that and they found out that's, that's not what Paul was talking about, right? It is humanly, physically impossible to stay up awake and pray. 24-7, but what he's talking about is that at every season, in every moment, whenever you're awake, when you're not talking to somebody, right, when you're not doing something, talk to God. Pray. Pray without ceasing. If there's something on your heart, pray. Pray until you receive a peace about it, right? Pray until you've heard from God what he's saying in his word. Pray without ceasing. Pray until you know what the will of God is. And then he says, now may, this is interesting. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Here is the sixth and final time that Paul mentions the return of Jesus. The fifth time we see it in the beginning of chapter 5. Here's the sixth time, right? We can kind of get a sense of uh, what this letter is all about. He is teaching us about the return of Jesus. But what is he talking about? May your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete. Does that mean like there's a chance that we would not be preserved by the Lord? That's not what Paul is talking about. He's not saying that somehow we might lose our salvation, our place in heaven. Because notice what he goes on to say. Verse 24, faithful is who? He. Faithful is God who calls you. God is not going to drop you and say, you know what? You messed up too many times and, I, you know, I'm done with you. That's not what he's doing. That's not what Paul is saying. Faithful is God who calls you and he will also bring it to pass. What Paul is saying in verse 23 is a prayer that we would be dedicated to the Lord. Over and over and over, Paul has been commending the believers to be sanctified, to be set apart, to live not like the world, but live as children of God. Abstain from immorality. Abstain from drunkenness. Be alert and be sober. And what Paul is saying and praying is that we would be unstained from the world. That we'll be set apart, not behaving like the world. And that when you stand before Christ, when He comes back, and he's been talking about it six times now in this letter. When you stand before him, may you be blameless. And so the question should come, how are we living today? Are we living as children of day and of light? Are we keeping our eyes open for Jesus? Are we living a life of thanksgiving as Paul says that this is the will of God? Be thankful always. Are we living as a people of holiness? In chapter 4, he says, This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from immorality. Are we living as a people who are always telling others about Jesus? Like Paul commended the Thessalonians in chapter 1. How are we living for Jesus today? Furthermore, the real question is, are you ready for the return of Jesus? Because what Paul is saying to us today in chapter 5 is that we're to be alert and sober because Jesus is coming soon. Be alert and sober because Jesus is coming soon. And with that, are you ready for the return of Jesus? Because when Jesus comes back, He will hold us accountable for what we might have done or not done with Him and His message. When He comes back, He'll pour out His wrath onto all mankind. Everyone who have rejected Him, who have never received Him, they will experience His wrath, His judgment, their punishment for their sin. It should cause us to pause for a second 
and ask, am I ready for Jesus to come back? Are my friends ready for Jesus to come back? Are my family and relatives ready for Jesus to come back? Close your eyes and bow your head for a second. As we reflect on this message that Jesus is coming soon, that we're to be ready. Are you ready if Jesus were coming back today? If He were to appear through the clouds and the, trump the trumpet sounds and the roll is called up yonder, are you ready for Jesus to return? If today you realize that you are not ready, if today you realize, man, I, I have never made a decision to trust Jesus. I have never followed Him. Today is the moment for you to make that right. Today is the moment for you to say, God, I need you. I am afraid of your wrath. I don't deserve your love, but I need you, and I need your forgiveness. Today is the day when you come to Him in prayer and say, God, I want to ask for your forgiveness. I want to ask that you forgive me of my sin and I want to trust you today. I receive what you've done for me through Jesus on the cross. And I want to ask for forgiveness. I believe in your Son whom you raised from the dead and I want to follow Him. The Scripture is clear that we're to be alert and sober waiting for Jesus. May you begin living your life today for Jesus, waiting for His return. For others of you, maybe you do know Jesus, but you realize, man, I've been walking out of line with Jesus. I've been living like the world. People can't tell me apart from believers or unbelievers. Today is the moment for you to repent and say, you know, God, I, I, I haven't been doing it right. I haven't been showing the world that I'm a believer. I haven't been telling anybody that I'm a believer because I don't live like a believer. Take this moment to say, God, I want to turn back to you. I need to follow you. I need to get my life in order. And it begins with you. I put you first. My number one, help me to live for you, God. And for the rest of us, May we be sober and alert, growing in our faith, fellowshipping with one another, growing in our love for the Lord and for one another. Father, we pray to thank you for this word. What a sobering word that we've heard to, today from you. God, that we are to not only be watchful, but that we are to live for you in a manner that we would reflect who we are as sons of light and sons of day. God, I pray that from this moment forward, we would behave and live and talk in such a way that will reflect you and our identity as sons of light and sons of day as we watch for your return. Oh God, how we cannot wait until you come back to make things right. God, we entrust these things to you and we pray that would you seal your word upon our hearts and help us to live for you every single day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.